Welcome back. My name is Derek Main and I review translated literature. Today I am going to review The Seventh Function of Language. And this is by Laurent Beignet, translated from the French by Sam Taylor, and it is a Picador, uh, is the publisher of my copy. So this is actually my second take on reviewing this because the first time I ended up with like a four minute rant on my issues with leftist politics in America as a leftist. So that'll give you an idea that this is the kind of book that makes you think and it makes you go off into crazy tangents. I really liked it. And let me start off with just telling you the setup. So the literary critic Roland Barth dies and he's hit by a van. And that part is true. That actually is how he passes away, I think in 1981 or something like that. Uh, the rest is obviously all made up. So an investigator in France who's kind of like, in America, I would think of him as sort of your typical like tough, street smart cop who is kind of like fed up with academics and the hippies, but, he, but he's a really smart guy, right? Like he, he just um, is not an academic and he's thrust into this academic world. He comes to investigate the death. And what is kind of quickly found out is that Roland Barth, at the time of his death, has with him a folder that contains some papers that have the seventh function of language in within it. And the seventh function of language is purported to be this document that could teach any orator or debater how to convince anyone of anything. So it's kind of this, this rules that you could use to use your words to have ultimate power, okay? So you can see why that would be something that a lot of different people would want to get their hands on. And we've got like Japanese, Bulgarians, Russians, uh, French socialists, kind of an, an academics all throughout this book intertwined trying to get a hold of this knowledge of this piece of paper. And so very early on, the investigator realizes that he is going to be diving into Parisian cafes and sort of dusty academic halls and weird conferences, and he needs a guide to help him understand this world. And so he finds this graduate student or professor um, of linguistics that can help him sort of translate, um, for lack of a better term, but you know, what it is that's going on. And so this book then becomes our own guide as the reader into this world of semiology. And semiology is the study of signs. This also brings us into obviously linguistics, but then philosophy, logic, and because of the nature of the document, I would say most notably political philosophy. This right here is the section where I ended up getting into my little, you know, fury about uh, leftist politics and the issues between fighting between class and identity. But anyway, we're not going to do that this time. It, to focus on the book, it is a really, really fun read because it is written like a thriller. I don't read a lot or any of like John Le Carre or, or those kind of like popular thrillers, but... I can anticipate and I think that someone that reads that a lot would really grow to kind of understand the form of this. You know, there's car crashes and bombings and there's little points that are kind of like Sherlock Holmes and Watson investigator tricks where we use semiology, the study of signs, to kind of go through and figure out all these things about a person just by walking into his office, you know. And those are really fun and kind of a, a very popular and uh, sort of mainstream fiction way of telling this very dense story, right? Because what they're going to use, what he's going to use this thriller function to do is to talk about these ideas that these different semiologists and linguistics have that are frankly very difficult to get a hold of. If you're reading it in sort of a, a dry academic text, I think that you could very quickly skip over it unless you were well steeped into it or very interested. And that's the part that makes it so much fun because you are kind of being guided along this really interesting academic path, but doing so in a really, really uh, fun and funny and exciting way. 
my critique of the book is a critique of myself, which is I do wish that I had a better grasp of these topics. That makes it a little hard at times because I can see that there's a lot of humor and there's a lot more depth if you really understood the debates that are going on between these uh, linguistics. I mean, there's debates going on between like Derrida and Searle and Chomsky and Derrida and Umberto Eco that honestly, like I, I, it's very difficult as like a layman with this stuff to understand what exactly it is that they are that they are debating. Even with the guide and even with the examples, like I'm smart enough to like hear an example of something like interlocutory or whatever and and I get that one example but I don't see then how it is applicable to like overall political philosophy and I went down a lot of rabbit holes while I was reading this trying to google and understand the real debates that that were going on at that time some of which continue on about these linguistic structures and political philosophies and frankly that part was a little difficult for me to understand, I do think that you would get a little bit more joy out of it if you were more inclined towards um, that type of study, just if you had some kind of background. I had no background with that. Um, but again, that also is what makes it fun. I mean, the fun, one of the best things about literature is learning about something completely foreign and alien to you. I think the problem with this is it's something that it affects our day-to-day -day lives, right? Because f political philosophy is, is important and we all live through that. And we can, I can kind of see hints of where these disagreements have ended up um, shaping our world. I just wish I had a more fuller understanding. And that's a critique of me, not, not of the book, because I think the book does as good a job as you can making some of these really dense concepts approachable. So one thing I want to talk about the book is there's this, and one of the things I think it does really well there's this group in the book called Logos Club, and it is like a centuries old debate club that the greatest orators, linguistic debaters like um, debate in. And the way the Logos Club works is if you challenge someone and you fail, pow, they chop off a finger, you lose a digit. And what I really like about that, besides the fact that going into those Logos clubs and listening to the debates are really fun because there's that heightened tension between like when this person, if this person loses, they're going to lose a finger. And in some cases worse because of the nature of who they're, um, who they're challenging. It kind of like builds up on a sliding scale depending on how audacious you want to be. But uh, what I like about that is it shows that this stuff is important. Like it's not just an academic issue that is is trapped in those conferences and dusty academic halls and stuff. It's stuff that really does seep out into the world and shape our world. And so I like that a whole lot. And you can see throughout the book that there's times where he will bring up the, you know, the Simon, who is the, the graduate or the professor who is our guide through this, will maybe bring up a philosophical question that folks are debating. And then Maybe 10, 5, 10 pages later, within the context of the actual story, that question will kind of be answered. One really cool example is the question of legal violence. So the philosophical question of is legal violence still violence brought up? And I think it's on page 357. Is that right? I have a little guide here, but of course, um, no, 323. Okay, so 323 of my copy. Here we go. So that question is brought up, and then a few pages later, he's in a conversation, and this is, this is what we've got. Bayard tries to argue his point. He belonged to a terrorist organization. The IRA kill people, don't they? Simon almost chokes. That's exactly what Laval said about the resistance. I wouldn't have wanted a cop like you checking my papers in 1940. So that's kind of fun, right? Like the question of is legal violence violence is answered there with absolutely yes. And a great real life example is the Nazis. Because just because you were following orders as we learn from um, history and the trials and stuff, that, is not a, that does not mean that you are not inflicting violence or that what you are doing is not morally wrong. Orders are not the end all be all. That is not sort of the end of ethics that you have to question for yourself. So I've got my I've got my pal's bookstore cup today and since I'm doing a French novel, my Shakespeare and Company shirt. 
couple other things I want to go into the book that I really liked. There is the question of life versus literature, which I think comes up a lot in the type of books I read. I think you'll remember from my last review of Enrique Villamatas, it certainly came up. And that is actually a thread throughout here, oddly enough, as well. And I really liked some of the quotes. So on 234 of my copy, the root of critical error is a naive confusion of literature with life. So the, the, the critical error is a confusion of literature with life. And later on, life is an open system. Literature is a closed system. Life is made of things, literature of words. I like that, and it ties in with what I was talking about as sort of the weight and the importance of what these academics are debating. And I think that this author is an expert or has been a professor of this of these types of subjects before. I believe when I was looking into it, that was true. And what a great job he does of showing exactly how much it matters and why it matters. And there you're kind of seeing the difference between, yes, they're here to these words, and then there's life, and, and, and that's the difference. Uh, reality versus living in a novel is another one that one of our characters, Simon, is struggling with at times, and again, is a theme that I've seen quite a bit lately in, in literature. It will definitely be in my next review, which I'll tell you about in a minute, but how do you know that you're not in a novel? How do you know that you're not living inside a work of fiction? How do you know that you're real? So those questions come up, and then 30 pages later on 341, we actually get an answer to that. What is it, the real? You know it when you bump into it, Lacan says. Um, and again, I like that. You're seeing the difference between these thoughts that are in your head and these ideas versus you know it when you bump into it. Now, all of a sudden, it's real. This ties in, too, with the idea of God as a novelist, and this is my favorite section of the book. This is 357. He senses that the novelist, if he exists, is not his friend. So first off, I really like that when a character within a work of fiction has that sort of like meta, breaking the fourth wall, um, postmodernism, whatever it is, where they are sort of understanding, hold on, am I in a work of fiction? And there's that fear and insecurity that they've lost some of their will and that they are being guided as opposed to making their own decisions. The reason I think that's very interesting is because I think we feel that in our own lives too, right? Like what is the nature of our own free will? How much of it do we actually have versus what is being authored and what is already um, laid out in front of us and we are just sort of pawns on that on that stage. He must deal with this hypothetical novelist the way he deals with God. Always act as if God did not exist. Because if God does exist, he is at best a bad novelist who merits neither respect nor obedience. I love that part. <laughs> I love the idea that, okay, if God does exist, he's a bad novelist, no respect or obedience. And while that's sort of a dark take on things, um, it's wonderful. And it's a really, really uh, great section I like a lot. So the last thing I want to kind of say about this book is that there were some mixed and I thought weird reviews as I looked through it. And there seemed to be kind of two camps. There's those who find it too pop fiction, maybe too thriller-esque, and it's not, you know, very serious. And then there's the other side, which is the exact flip of the coin that feels like, well, this stuff is uh, pretentious or this stuff is too dense and that makes it not fun. And I think that's really interesting that people had both of those reactions. I think both could be valid depending on what you're expecting from this book when you open it. And that's an issue a lot of times with the things we read, right? I was listening to a great, I was listening to a 3% podcast, which Chad Post does, who is the director of Open Letter and uh, a publisher in uh, translated lit literature in Rochester, New York. He does it with another gentleman. I think his name is Tom, who co-owns Riff Raff Books in Providence, which like complete um, coincidence and did not realize that the next book that I'm reviewing, which I'll talk about in a minute, is translated by his wife. So anyway weird connections there but they were talking this was i don't know earlier this year and chad post gave this idea of wanting to get 
like 10 books or something that were so far in advance that hadn't been published yet, and he wanted all the, the distinguishing features removed. So no author, no translator, no publisher, no country, no year. Just give me the wall of text, let me read it, see what I can guess, what I can't, but also what my impressions are and how my impressions would change not knowing that information. <clears throat> I think that's really interesting because I think I am guilty and we're all guilty of already loving and deciding on a book based on who publishes it. Of course, based on who writes it, but that's a little different, right? Like Enrique Villamatis, to give a, an example from my last one. I mean, when he comes out with a new book, when Caesar Aria comes out with a new book, I love it. I mean, I think we can pretty much, you know, we can we can rely on that. But we've already got this idea in our heads. But we've I've got a book coming, I think that is next month. Um, Despartes, I think is her name. And it's... Um, it's Vernon Subutex. It's another French book that's by a woman that's like the underground punk scene. And I mean, I, I haven't even read any reviews that I can tell you right now. Like, I'm sure that this book is for me. Like, I'm sure I'm going to love it based on it, just the brief description of what it is, right? And, and I think that, that what we bring to a book before we even open it up does have a big impact on whether we like it or not. And that's where I think this lies because... The folks that, that say, well, this is too thriller and this isn't really serious literature, I think we're going in for that heavy philosophy and that and that and um, the characters that they were going to be discussing is what they were looking for, uh, whereas it is a pop thriller and it is fun. And then on the other side, I could see someone who is picking this up for that reason, thinking this is going to be a fun romp pop thriller with car chases and, and say, gosh, there's a ton of stuff in here about, you know... Um, linguistics and semiology that is just very difficult to understand and logic and structures and like I said earlier interlocutory and words I can't even pronounce and, and maybe they think well this just isn't that much fun so I can see why both things happen but I really think it, it has to do with what you bring to the table with it and for this book for me it worked I think for some it won't um, depending on your experience with either of those things right what type of reader you are and what you typically gravitate towards and then also how familiar and how interested, probably more prominently, you are in those sites, kinds of ideas and thinkers that, that they're talking about. So that's what I thought about the seventh function of language. I think it's pretty open and shut as far as if you should read it. If you hear the description of what it's about and you're on board, then you're going to like it, I think. I really do. But if you hear it and you think, oh, I don't like the format of that or I'm not interested in those ideas, then it's probably not for you. And that is perfectly cool. So the next book that I'm going to review on my channel, I think is the, <clears throat> one of the three best books I've read this year. Um, I haven't made any lists or anything yet, but I, I think it will definitely end up at the top. This is Revenge of the Translator by Bruce, no, I'm sorry, Bryce Mathusit. <clears throat> excuse me, and translated from the French by Emma Ramadan. This was put out by Deep Vellum. They're a publisher out of Dallas, Texas in, in America that does a lot of wonderful translated fiction. Um, I loved this book and I'm really excited to talk about it because very rarely do I have a book that I love and I'm ready to get into, but I also have some actual pretty serious critiques of as well. So even though it's there up on my top whatever list, um, I've got some serious things to say about it that I think uh, places that it falls short. So anyway, that's my review for today. As I said, this is the first time I ever did a second take. And who knows if this one's even better, but I think it's probably better than me complaining um, about having a lack of choices as a leftist here in American politics. So... Um, I hope everyone is doing great and be good to folks. All right.